hear an external student making an appointment with a receptionist to see a counsellor at Grisham College. First, look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example already done for you. For this question only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. I'd like to make an appointment to see a student counsellor. Yes, certainly. Are you a student at the college? Yes. I'm studying linguistics, second year. Right. I'll just get a few details. Jack said that he is in his second year, which means he is a current student. So B is the correct answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. I'd like to make an appointment to see a student counsellor. Yes, certainly. Are you a student at the college? Yes. I'm studying linguistics, second year. Right. I'll just get a few details. What's your student number? 027 Seven, double eight, o oh, four, and there should be three letters on the end of that. Oh yes, ext. I guess that means external. Yes, that's right. Jack Laracy, is that right? Yes, that's me. What's your date of birth, Jack? Second of May, nineteen seventy-nine. Are you still living in Malden? No, I moved to Chelmsford last week, actually. What's your new address then? Seventeen. Roxford Avenue, Chelmsford. Is that R O C K S F O R D? Yes, that's right. The postcode for Chelmsford is C M three nine four Y. Thanks. What time would you like to have your interview? When are you open? The office is open from eight a.m. to five p.m., but we can schedule appointments from eight in the morning through till seven at night. That's great. The evening would suit me better. How about six on Thursday night? Terrific. Do I come here for the interview? Yes, but because the office closes at five, the door will be locked. Just ring the doorbell and the counsellor will let you in. Where's the doorbell? It's just under the sign. Jack arrives at the counsellor's office for his interview and meets one of the student counsellors. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions 6 to 10. Before the conversation continues, read questions 6 to 10. Hi, you must be Jack. I'm Ellen Short, one of the student counsellors at Grisham College. Nice to meet you, Ellen. I see you're an external student, Jack. Do you find it difficult to do your assignments without going to lectures? Oh, not really. We get really good study guides that have all the information we need, but we can also contact the lecturers by phone or email. It's been a great course. That's good to hear. Now, what can I help you with? I'd like to talk about my career options. I'm teaching French at the moment and studying linguistics but I've been offered a research position at the university. I really don't know whether to take the position or not. Oh, I see. Do you enjoy teaching? Well, yes. For the most part, I do. I find teaching very satisfying. It's great to see students do well. And, of course, I love the summer holiday. Six weeks at the end of the school year is fantastic. Yes, but you'd get a long summer holiday at the university, wouldn't you? Yes, I think it's an even longer period. Is there anything that you don't like about teaching? Oh, yes. Lazy students who don't want to do any work, or the ones that behave badly and disturb the rest of the class. That can be very difficult. I guess I am a little tired of teaching. The pay for teachers isn't very good either. In fact, I find it difficult to save any money from my salary. I see. So what do you think the advantages of working at the university will be? 
Well, as I said, it's a research position, which means I wouldn't be teaching. It would be nice to have a break. The pay will be much better than what I'm getting at the moment, and, of course, I'd still get a long summer holiday. And professionally, I think working at a university would help me in the future. So, are there any negatives? Well, the only real negative that I can think of is that I'll be working by myself. I'm not really used to that. It seems with teaching that there's always somebody around, whether it's the students or teachers or parents. So, you could only think of one disadvantage. Well, I'd have to travel a longer distance. At the moment, I just walk to school, but I'd have to drive for about 35 minutes to the university. Right, Jack. Let's write down all of the advantages and disadvantages in both jobs. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. Right. Let's start with the advantages of teaching. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 of your listening question booklet. Section 2 You will hear Constable Andrew Gray talking about a problem in the Darlinghurst area to a group of international students at the University of Technology International Centre. As you listen to the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Before you listen, look at questions 11 to 15. Before I start, I'd like to thank the University of Technology International Centre for allowing me to come and talk to you all this afternoon. The reason for my visit is to outline a problem that female international visitors and students have been having in the Darlinghurst area. For the last month or so, thieves have been targeting the area, snatching handbags and backpacks from unsuspecting women. Now, as you probably know, Darlinghurst is very popular with tourists for shopping and sightseeing, and it's also a popular meeting place for students. There are lots of cafes and coffee shops and Unfortunately, we've had some thieves taking advantage of these conditions. Now, the thieves are young and fit. They grab the bag from the woman's shoulder or out of her hand when she's involved with something else. You know, deep in conversation or window shopping. So they grab the bag and then run away very quickly. By the time the victim realises what's happened, the young man's out of sight and there's little hope of catching him. The victims are always female and almost always a visitor to the area. When these incidents first started, the victims were always by themselves, but now it seems they're becoming braver and targeting women in groups. Age doesn't seem to matter to the thieves, it's just a matter of opportunity. They look for someone who isn't consciously protecting their bag, and for a place with an easy getaway. You know, not too crowded. We've only had two of these bag snatchers almost caught when the victims chased after them. Unfortunately, on both occasions, as soon as the women reached the thief, he threw the bag right at them and then escaped. And one woman was hurt quite badly. They really are brazen. We don't encourage you to chase these thieves. There are many small laneways and streets in Darlinghurst that the thieves can escape into. We just don't know what they're likely to do, and we certainly don't want anyone to get hurt. So, what can you do? Well, unfortunately, not much. But we are asking that you be aware of this danger. If possible, walk with a friend while you're in the area. Hang on to your bags carefully. Don't leave your bags on the ground at one of the many cafes while you have a coffee or a meal, and don't leave it on a chair or tabletop. In other words, 
be alert at all times and conscious of your bag while you're in the area. We also caution you about carrying anything too valuable in your bags. Don't, for instance, carry too much cash and please ensure that you know the details of all of your credit cards. It seems like the thieves are not only after cash. They've been using credit cards illegally on the internet to purchase goods or access pornographic sites. So some of our targets not only lose the cash they have in their bags, but they get a nasty surprise when their credit card bills arrive at the end of the month. It's vital that you keep your credit card details and report your loss to police. Before the final part of the talk, look at questions 16 to 20. Now you will hear the rest of the talk. Answer questions 16 to 20. If you take these precautions and still get robbed, please contact your nearest police station. You can, of course, come to the Darlinghurst Police Station, but this isn't necessary. The police will need to get certain details, in particular, your name, your contact phone number, and the time that the robbery took place. We'll also ask you for the exact location of the incident. Please take note of the nearest cross street or laneway. A lot of the victims haven't been able to tell us this, but it is vital if we're going to catch these thieves. Well, try to remember the name of the nearest shop. We are trying to establish any patterns to the thefts. We will also need a full description of the bag or article that was snatched. Most of the bags are found discarded nearby with the cash and credit cards gone. Obviously, you'll need to cancel your credit cards as a matter of urgency. The only protection you have against being made responsible for illegal use of your credit card is if you report the card stolen before the thieves can use it. We are confident that these thieves will stop their practice if we show that we're aware of their presence and limit their profits. The Darling Earth Police have some plain clothes female detectives in the area now and we're sure to catch them. Getting accurate locations of these incidents is vital. It's not our intention to frighten any of you, but we do want you to be aware of the problem and hopefully avoid any trouble. Are there any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 of your listening question booklet. Section 3. In this section, you will hear two students talking to their tutor about a presentation they are going to give. First, look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the discussion and answer questions 21 to 30. Jane and Rick, nice to see you both. How's your presentation coming along? Well, that's why we're here. We'd like to ask you for some clarification. Yes, I'm afraid we are not quite sure that we understand exactly what you'd like us to include in our report. I'm glad that you came to see me, but the deadline is only three weeks away. Are you going to have it done by then? Oh, yes. We think we've done most of the time-consuming work. We just have to pull the information from the survey together and present it in the right format. That's good to hear. Collating is the fun part. Did you follow the steps I outlined in the questionnaire survey? Yes. We found that the most difficult step was the first one, defining our objectives and then, of course, writing the items to match. What topic did you choose? We decided to survey international students about their experiences and the challenges that they faced when they first came to Australia. Right. 
That's a very broad topic to survey. <laughs> we found that out the hard way. We sure did. But we are happy with our work, aren't we, Jane? Yes, so far. Yes, so far. We handed out almost 400 surveys to international students, not all from Longholm either. We sent 150 to the Western Australian Education Department in Perth and 120 to Griffin Technical College in Melbourne. I'm pleased to hear that you didn't restrict the survey to Longholm. No, we wanted to find out the responses from a range of international students in Australia, as opposed to the experiences at one tertiary institution only. We chose a technical college as well as a university campus and a high school. That gave us access to students of different ages and different disciplines. So, how many respondents did you get? Well, in our trial of the survey, we received 44 out of the 50 surveys. That's 88%. But that was tightly controlled. We didn't expect such a high percentage of returns from the actual survey itself. We had hoped to receive about 70%. Yes, we were both a bit surprised, really. We got over 320 surveys returned. 322, to be exact. That's 80%. 322 out of 400? Yes, that is an impressive rate of response. Did you have to do a lot of follow-up work to get those? We sent out some postcard reminders to some students who hadn't returned the surveys by the deadline, and from them we received another 38 surveys back. Rick had written a very persuasive transmittal letter that accompanied the survey. In the letter, he appealed for their individual contribution so that the situation for international students might improve. Transmittal letters can be very effective. Well done. So, it sounds like you followed the correct procedure up until now. You set your objectives and wrote items to match those objectives. You gave out trial surveys, collected them, chased the late surveys. I hope you had also analysed your pre-test trial results before sending out the actual surveys. Yes. Analysing the data from the trial survey was very useful. We checked all of the responses to each item in the pretest and found a pattern in some items that had been left unanswered. We rewrote those items that were ambiguous or open to different interpretation. The actual survey worked better because of this. Trial surveys can be invaluable. So, you sent out your transmittal letters with the survey and got a high percentage of responses. You shouldn't have any problems making general conclusions for your survey. Yes, we have collated all of our data, which took ages after we received the actual surveys back. We haven't started to make conclusions yet because we are not sure how to begin our report. You've done the majority of the work, as Jane said, the time-consuming part. It'll probably help you to know the three main criteria I'll be using to mark your presentations. The first is the quality of your questions objectives. Make sure that you don't give me aims of the survey. I want clear objectives for each item. The second criterion is the quality of the items in your questionnaire. Well, we are quite confident with the items. We analyse the pretest trial quite thoroughly. Yes, you have already completed that section, obviously. The third criterion will be judging the quality of your analysis of the data and the conclusions that you draw. This is always the most interesting part of the presentations for me. Should this include percentages and tables and graphs to display the data? Absolutely. Make your conclusions as visual as possible. They should be easy to read and easy to follow. Ensure that the tables and graphs are clearly labelled with appropriate headings and only include relevant data. That's great. Thank you very much. We know what we need to do next. Yes, thanks a lot. My pleasure. I look forward to seeing your presentation in March. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4 of your listening question booklet. Section 4 You will hear a lecture about project management being given by a university lecturer. First, look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to begin today with a quick review of last week's lecture. We saw the definition of project management as something which has a clear beginning and a clear completion date with goals, a budget and a schedule. We saw its presence in the private and public sectors in many different industries. You'll also remember that we outlined the life cycle, as it were, of a project and looked at the first of a four-stage cycle, establishing the limits of the project. Today we're going to talk broadly about the second stage of project management, developing a plan for the project. Next week we'll focus on the implementation of the project, and then the final stage, its evaluation. Let's get started on today's topic though, planning the project. The success of a project will depend on the skills and care which you put in at this initial planning stage. Planning is not only necessary in terms of budget or cost, it's also crucial that you consider the time frame of a project and the standards which you'll be expected to provide. These three elements are, of course, integrated. Project planning is best conducted as a team. You might have to take responsibility for handing over the final plan but without a team behind you, you'll find it almost impossible to plan effectively. We'll discuss budgetary planning firstly, because that is, of course, what you are most likely to be evaluated on by your own manager. Before drawing up a budget, you'll need to understand the time frame involved to carry out the work and the standard of delivery at which the labour and materials are to be supplied. Now. This is arguably the most difficult to plan for. You'll never plan completely accurately for a project in terms of money, but you will become better at planning realistically. And it is this part of the planning process that you will do last. The best way to plan the cost of a project is to consider all the factors involved and how those factors relate to time and standard of delivery. Write these down on a spreadsheet format and begin the task of costing and estimating. The company that you're employed by will always have their own systems in place for doing this. They will also indicate the kind of profit they are looking for, usually in percentage terms. The second stage of planning is the allocation of time to a project and for this you'll have to canvass others for help. Only by asking the advice and opinions of those with expertise in the field will you be able to establish the size of each unit of work to be completed and the order in which those units of work should be carried out. Remember that some units of work may be done simultaneously but many cannot. In your tutorials this week you'll be introduced to the Gantt chart. That's G A N. T. This method of planning project activities has been very successful in the field of project management. The complete set of tasks involved in a project are identified and then planned in relation to each other. You'll soon discover that organizing and prioritizing activities is quite an art form. The third part of your planning, as I said, will affect your money and time considerations and that is the standard of delivery that the project demands. These standards will be outlined in the tender documents if they've been your guide or the master plan from which you're working. Always make sure that you for every unit of work that is to be completed you'll have to write specifications. They are detailed descriptions 
outlining specific standards of quality in materials and labour. If these specifications are not carefully written and then complied with, the project is unlikely to be successful. These specifications will be referred to many times once the project is underway. You will also have to deal with a quality assurance manager at this stage, who will advise you on the standards which need to be met. Quality management has become a valued component in successful project management companies. I've provided you with an outline of the planning process for project management, but you'll be looking at these three elements in more depth in your tutorials this week. That is the end of section 4 and the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers.